representation. Hello, I'm Bill Hartley, President of Audio Renaissance Tape, and I'm very pleased to introduce you to our presentation of one of the most influential self-help books of all time, Psycho-Cybernetics by Dr. Maxwell Maltz. These two cassettes and the booklet that accompanies them are designed as two interrelated parts of a program. The tapes will provide you with a solid grounding in the basic concept of psycho-cybernetics. The booklet provides additional information and specific exercises for you to work with those concepts and integrate them into your daily life. As we were preparing this program, we were fortunate to gain access to a unique archive of recordings by Dr. Maltz. And so, on these tapes, you'll not only hear material from the best-selling book, but you'll also hear related comments from Dr. Maltz himself, recorded in studio, as well as anecdotes and stories recorded live on location at various seminars and lectures. Although the quality of the location recordings is uneven, we've restored the tapes as much as possible. We thought you'd enjoy this rare opportunity to hear Dr. Maltz at his best, live before an audience. You are invited to join Dr. Maxwell Maltz, the author of the book Psycho-Cybernetics, on the greatest adventure of your life. It will be your greatest voyage of discovery, the discovery of your big self. You, with your own strength, can change your life for the better through psychocybernetics. What is psychocybernetics? It is not merely a psychology or philosophy of life. It is not positive thinking. It is positive doing. It is a guide, a gateway to creative living. Cybernetics, what does it mean? First of all, it comes from a Greek word which means a helmsman, a man who steers the ship to port. And psycho is a word I coined, which means steering your mind to a productive, useful goal so that you can reach the greatest port in the world. Peace of mind. Now, psycho means many, many things. It means how to improve your self-image, how to stand up under stress, how to turn a crisis into an opportunity. It means the conquest of frustration. It means the art of communication. psycho isn't a cult. It isn't a religion. It's just a way of life to get more living out of life, to make you the big you, the greater share of the time rather than the little you. It also means, most important of all, the search for your self-respect. Dr. Maxwell Maltz specialized in plastic surgery, but made some very interesting discoveries in the field of psychology. He found that many amazing changes often occur quite suddenly and dramatically in a person's personality when you change his or her face. But it was his failures that taught him the most. Some patients showed no change in their personality after surgery. Some patients who had a freakish feature which was corrected by surgery continued to feel inadequate and experienced feelings of inferiority. These patients continue to feel, act, and behave just as if they still had an ugly face. A young girl came to my office many, many years ago. She was 18, a beautiful blonde child. She had a scar on her left cheek. I operated on her, and when I removed the final dressing from her cheek, I was very, very proud of the result, and I said, take a look at yourself in the mirror. She looked. Oh, doctor, I don't see any difference. I was 25 years younger, it attracted my ego. I said, what do you mean that you don't see any difference? Here's a picture taken immediately after the accident. Don't you see the scar? She looked. Yes, I see the scar. Well, take a look at yourself in the mirror again. She looked and finally said, well, doctor, I see a difference, but I don't feel any different. Two years before the accident, she was engaged to a young man who suddenly ran off and married someone else. Now, that left her with hurt feelings, with feelings of remorse, with feelings of resentment 
with feelings of guilt that she was nobody. And I said, my dear child, how could you hold yourself responsible for something you didn't do? You didn't run away, he did. Now, for goodness sake, why do you blame yourself? Now, that experience opened up a whole new vista, a whole new horizon for me. I realized that a plastic surgeon deals with scars on the faces of 1% of the population. And I said to myself, wouldn't it be a marvelous idea if I could write a book for the 99% of people with normal faces like yours and like mine who have some inner corrosion, a scar that they put there themselves inside. I said, wouldn't that be a marvelous idea if I could write a book and teach people to be their own plastic surgeon? Not using a knife, of course, but a little compassion for themselves to dig deep, deep, deep within them to remove the scar they put there themselves. Many people have inner emotional scars who have never suffered physical injuries. The result on personality is the same. These people have been hurt or injured by someone in the past. To guard against future injury from that source, they form a spiritual callus, an emotional scar to protect their ego. This scar tissue, however, not only protects them from the individual who originally hurt them, it protects them against all other human beings. An emotional wall is built through which neither friend nor foe can pass. Dr. Maltz began to realize that the physical image itself was not the real key to changes in personality. There was something else which had to be changed before the person could feel good about himself. It was as if personality itself had a face. This non-physical face of personality seemed to be the real key to personality change. If it remains scarred, distorted, ugly, or inferior, the person himself acted out this role in his behavior regardless of the changes in physical appearance. If this face of personality could be reconstructed, if old emotional scars could be removed, then the person himself changed, even without facial plastic surgery. Dr. Maltz became more and more convinced that the self-image, or the individual's mental and spiritual concepts or picture of his or herself, was the real key to personality and behavior. Numerous other case studies showed that the self-image is the key to human personality and human behavior. Change the self-image, and you change the personality and behavior. The self-image sets the boundaries of individual accomplishment. It defines what you can and cannot do. Expand the self-image, and you expand the area of the possible. The development of an adequate, realistic self-image will seem to imbue the individual with new capabilities, new talents, and literally turn failure into success. Today, there is a reputable clinical evidence in the field of psychology that there are success-type personalities and failure-type personalities, happiness-prone personalities, and unhappiness-prone personalities, and health-prone personalities and disease-prone personalities. We will discuss these characteristics later in this tape. Psycho-cybernetics throws new light on these and many other observable facts of life. It throws new light on the power of positive thinking, and more importantly, explains why it works with some individuals and not with others. Positive thinking can work only when it is consistent with the individual's self-image. It literally cannot work when it is inconsistent with the self-image, until the self-image itself has been changed. In order to understand self-image psychology and use it in your own life, you need to know something of the mechanism it employs to accomplish its goal. Scientific evidence shows that the human brain and nervous system operate purposefully in accordance with the known principles of cybernetics to accomplish goals of the individual. The brain and nervous system constitute a marvelous and complex goal-striving mechanism, a sort of built-in automatic guidance system which works for you as a success mechanism or against you as a failure mechanism, depending on how you, the operator, operate it, and the goals you set for it. The science of cybernetics does not tell us that man is a machine, but that man has and uses a machine. 
Moreover, it tells us how that machine functions and how it can be used. Self-image is changed for better or worse, not by intellect alone, but by experiencing. You developed your self-image by your creative experiencing in the past. You can change it by the same method. Your present state of self-confidence and poise is the result of what you have experienced rather than what you learned intellectually. You have probably been told all your life, nothing succeeds like success. And that is true. Memories of past successes act as built-in stored information, which gives us confidence for the present task. But how can a person draw upon memories of past successful experiences when one has experienced only failure? Psychoanalysis deals with the illnesses of yesterday. And psychocybernetics is quite different. It tries to keep you emotionally, spiritually, and mentally healthy now. What happened yesterday doesn't count anymore. It's what you are now that counts. Psychocybernetics is self-hypnosis. By auto-suggestion, you find the good in you instead of your defects, your inner scars. You become your own plastic surgeon by having a proper self-image and with a little compassion for yourself, you remove the inner scars you put there yourself. You become your own Michelangelo and with a little compassion you chip off the negative feelings that every human being is heir to. Michelangelo, when he was younger, looked at a stone quarry and he saw a huge block of stone and he said, I see Moses there. And he took a hammer and a chisel and he chipped away, day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, and after two years, there was Moses. And you, you are Michelangelo in your own right. You could chip off the negative feelings of frustration and despair from the personality that is you to find the big you. And how do you do it? By auto-suggestion. I say in my book, the mind cannot tell the difference between an actual experience or one vividly imagined. And you can imagine success if you think in terms of your own capabilities, and you can become successful. And when you use your imagination creatively, that's a form of hypnotism. The secret of psychocybernetics is not so much hypnotism, as to dehypnotize yourself from negative feelings. You hypnotize yourself into the belief that you are bigger than what you are, which is a form of using your imagination creatively, and dehypnotizing yourself from the negative beliefs that you can't do it. It's impossible. The point is, nothing in the world is impossible. In this tape, you will be asked to practice certain exercises and perform tasks but they must be done regularly if you are to derive maximum benefit from them. Before you become discouraged, keep practicing for a minimum period of 21 days. It usually takes that long before you will realize any perceptible change in your mental image. Following plastic surgery, it takes about 21 days for the average patient to get used to his new face. When an arm or a leg is amputated, the phantom limb persists for about 21 days. People must live in a new house for about three weeks before it begins to seem like home. It requires a minimum of about 21 days for an old mental image to dissolve and a new one to gel. You can neither prove nor disprove with intellectual argument the ideas and concepts described in this tape. You can prove them to yourself by doing them and judging results for yourself. Don't make a judgment for 21 days so that you will give yourself a fair chance to prove or disprove their validity in your own life. The building of an adequate self-image is something that should continue throughout a lifetime. You cannot accomplish a lifetime of growth in three weeks' time, but you can experience improvement within three weeks' time, and sometimes the improvement is quite dramatic. <laughs>
Just as disease can be diagnosed by a doctor from certain symptoms, failure and success can also be diagnosed. This is possible because people don't simply find success or failure, they carry the symptoms with them in their personalities. Within each person is a goal-striving mechanism, and to use it properly, individuals must have a clear-cut goal or target to shoot for. Many times people want to improve themselves and long for a better personality, but they have no clear-cut idea of the direction in which improvement lies, or what constitutes a good personality. Quite simply, a good personality is one which enables us to deal appropriately and effectively with our environment and with reality, and to gain satisfaction from reaching goals which are important to us. The success type personality has seven basic characteristics according to Dr. Maltz in his book, Psycho-Cybernetics. The first one is sense of direction. When you have no personal goal which interests you and means something to you, you are likely to go around in circles, feel lost, find life itself purposeless. You are built to conquer environment, solve problems, achieve goals, and you will find no real satisfaction or happiness in life without obstacles to conquer and goals to achieve. When people say that life is not worthwhile, they are really saying that they have no personal goals which are worthwhile. The prescription to overcome this deficiency is to find a goal or project worth working for. Decide where you are going. Always have something ahead of you to look forward to, to work for and hope for. Your body doesn't function well when you stop being a goal striver and have nothing to look forward to. This is the reason that very often when a person retires, he or she dies shortly thereafter. When you're not goal striving, not looking forward, you're not really living. The second characteristic of a success type personality is understanding. Understanding depends upon good communication and is vital to any guidance system. You cannot react appropriately if the information you act on is faulty or misunderstood. Many doctors believe that confusion is the basic element in neurosis. Most of our failures in human relations are due to misunderstanding. We expect other people to react and respond and come to the same conclusions as we do from a given set of facts or circumstances. Remember that no one reacts to things as they are, but to their own mental images. People don't disagree with you to be hard-headed or malicious. They disagree because they understand and interpret the situation differently from you. Give the other person credit for being sincere rather than malicious, and will go a long way toward better understanding. Ask yourself, how does this appear to other people? How do they interpret the situation? How do they feel about it? Try to understand why they act the way they do, and just as important, why you act the way you do. Too often we color incoming sensory data with our own fears, anxieties, or desires. To deal effectively with environment, we must be willing to acknowledge the truth about it. Only when we do this can we respond appropriately. Many of us are guilty of not liking to admit, even to ourselves, that we can be wrong. We fool ourselves into believing that a situation cannot be other than we would like it to be. The success type personalities not only do not cheat and lie to other people, they learn to be honest with themselves. Sincerity is based upon self-understanding and self-honesty. The prescription for overcoming lack of understanding is to look for true information concerning yourself, your problems, other people, a situation, whether it is good news or bad. Remember, it doesn't matter who's right, but what's right. In dealing with other people, always try to see the situation from their point of view, as well as your own. The third characteristic of a success type personality is courage. Having a goal and understanding the situation are not enough. You must have the courage to act. For only by actions can goals, desires, and beliefs be translated into realities. 
all problems, from personal to global, become smaller if you don't dodge them, but confront them. Often the difference between a successful person and a failure is not better abilities or ideas, but the courage that one has to bet on one's ideas, to take a calculated risk, and to act. Standing still or failure to act causes people who are faced with a problem to become nervous, feel impotent or trapped, and can bring on a host of physical symptoms. You need to study the situation thoroughly. Go over in your mind the various courses of action possible to you and the consequences which may follow from each one. Pick the course which gives the most promise and go ahead. If you wait until you're absolutely certain before you act, you will never do anything. Any time you act, you can be wrong. Any decision you make can turn out to be the wrong decision. But you must not let this deter you from going after the goal you want. You must have the courage daily to risk making mistakes, risk failure, risk being humiliated. A step in the wrong direction is better than staying on the same spot all your life. Once you're moving forward, you can correct your course as you go. Your automatic guidance system cannot guide you when you're stalled. The prescription for overcoming a lack of courage is to be willing to make a few mistakes, to suffer a little pain to get what you want. Don't sell yourself short. Most people don't know how brave they really are. You have the resources, but you never know you have them until you act and give them a chance to work for you. But don't wait until you can become a big hero in some dire crisis. Daily living also requires courage. By practicing courage in little things, we all develop the power and talent to act courageously in more important matters. The fourth characteristic of a successful personality is charity. You need to have interest in and regard for other people. Respect others' problems and needs. Respect the dignity of human personality. And deal with other people as human beings, not objects to be used. Recognize each person as a unique individual who deserves dignity and respect. It is a psychological fact that our feelings about ourselves tend to correspond to our feelings about others. When a person feels more charitable about others, he invariably begins to feel more charitable towards himself. We will develop a better and more adequate self-image when we begin to feel that other people have worth. Your prescription for becoming more charitable is to develop a genuine appreciation for people. Take the trouble to stop and think of the other person's feelings, viewpoints, desires, needs. Think of other people as being important and treat them accordingly. The fifth characteristic of a successful personality is self-esteem. When we doubt ourselves and feel inadequate to our tasks, we become difficult to get along with. Holding a low opinion of ourselves is not a virtue, but a vice. People with adequate self-esteem don't feel hostile toward others, aren't out to prove anything, can see facts more clearly, and aren't as demanding in their claims on other people. It is a well-known psychological fact that the people who become offended the easiest have the lowest self-esteem. We are hurt by those things we conceive of as threats to our ego or self-esteem. Even the real digs and cuts which inflict a terrible injury to the ego of the person with a low self-esteem do not make a dent in the ego of the person who thinks well of his or herself. It is people who feel undeserving, doubt their own capabilities, and have a poor opinion of themselves who become jealous easily. It is people who secretly doubt their own worth and who feel insecure within themselves, who see threats to their ego where there are none, that exaggerate and overestimate the potential damage from real or imagined threats. When people have adequate self-esteem, little slights offer no threat at all. They are simply passed over and ignored. Even deeper emotional wounds are likely to heal faster and cleaner with no festering sores to poison life and spoil happiness. 
Dr. Maltz points out that real self-esteem is not derived from the great things we've done, the things we own, the mark we've made, but an appreciation of ourselves for what each of us is, a unique person, a human being. The word esteem means to appreciate the worth of. How can a person stand in awe of all creation, the stars, the sea, the beauty of a flower, and at the same time downgrade oneself? Isn't mankind the most marvelous creation of all? Do not downgrade the product merely because you haven't used it correctly. The prescription for developing your self-esteem is to stop carrying around a mental picture of yourself as being a defeated, worthless person. Stop dramatizing yourself as an object of pity and injustice. Dr. Malt says we should assume responsibility for our own life and emotional needs. Develop a more self-reliant attitude. Try giving affection, love, approval, acceptance, understanding to other people and you will find them coming back to you as a sort of reflex action. You must make a decision between adjusting to reality or becoming a trophy. Every day is a new day. Every day you must adjust to the realities of the day. Every day your image changes, and you can make it change for the better when you adjust to the days using your creative instinct to find the big you. The mind cannot tell the difference between a successful experience or one vividly imagined. You can imagine the big you and work toward it within your training and capabilities. You must make a decision between two philosophies if you want to improve your self-image, go, 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 or no, no, no. Once you go, 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 even if you make a mistake, you correct it, and on the way, you will improve your self-image. You must realize that the whole business of living is to have enthusiasm about it, and you must make a decision between enthusiasm or emptiness. Can one really change one's self-image? Absolutely. Who does the changing for the better? Why, oh, you. Please fast forward to the end and turn the tape over for proper cueing of side two. What is the difference between confidence and conceit? Well, there's one word that separates them, and that is humility. You must be humble when you succeed and not be satisfied with all your achievements. And you must never brag about them any more than you should complain about your failures. Humility separates the person of achievement from the person of concealment. The sixth characteristic of a successful personality is confidence. Confidence is built upon an experience of success. When we begin a new undertaking, we are likely to have little confidence because we have not learned from experience that we can succeed. Remember, success breeds success. Even a small success can be used as a stepping stone to a greater one. An important technique to form is the habit of remembering past successes and forgetting failures. This is the way both an electronic computer and the human brain are supposed to operate. Practice improves skill and success. Repetition does not. If it did, 
we would perfect our errors instead of our accomplishments. Through practice and negative feedback, the computer in our brain remembers and reinforces successful attempts and forgets the mistakes. Yet many of us destroy our confidence by remembering past failures and forgetting all about past successes. We not only remember the failures, we impress them on our minds with emotion. We condemn ourselves and degrade ourselves with shame and remorse, and our self-confidence dissipates. It doesn't matter how many times you have failed in the past. What matters is the successful attempt, which should be remembered, reinforced, dwelt upon. Your prescription for developing confidence is to use mistakes as a way to learning, then dismiss them from your mind. Deliberately remember and picture to yourself past successes. Everyone has succeeded sometime at something. When you begin a new task, remember the feelings you experienced in past successes, regardless of how small they might have been. Too many people are prone to let one or two failures blot out all good memories. When you remember your brave moments, you will be pleasantly surprised to realize that you had more courage than you thought. Vividly remembering and visualizing past successes and brave moments is an invaluable aid whenever confidence is shaken. I remember when I was a medical student, I was studying pathology, second year medicine. And every time this Dr. Pappenheimer called upon me and quizzed me orally, I was frightened. I hated this Dr. Pappenheimer. And when I got up, I couldn't speak. I saw the 160 eyes of 80 students, and I thought they were about to ridicule me. I couldn't talk. I couldn't answer the question. And I sat down. That was a negative approach, the use of imagination negatively because of a fear. When I realized that I might not become a doctor, I decided I must do something about this. It happened that when there were written examinations, and I looked through a microscope at a slide, when I didn't see that face of Dr. Pappenheimer, when I didn't see the eyes of the students, I answered correctly. And so the desire, the goal of wanting to be a doctor made me do something at a time when I knew nothing about psychocybernetics, when I knew nothing about negative and positive images, at a time when I had the desire to be a doctor, I turned a crisis into an opportunity. I said to myself, the next time this so-and-so Pappenheim calls upon me, I will imagine that I don't see him. I will imagine that I don't see the 160 eyes of the other students. I will imagine I am looking through a microscope, looking at a slide and answering it correctly. The next time he called upon me, my constructive imagination came into good play. He was quite surprised that I wasn't fretful or fearful. And many of the students were surprised. And that's a long, long time ago when the desire to rise above a failure prompted me to turn a crisis into an opportunity. The point is, if I can do it, so can you. Dr. Maltz believes the seventh characteristic of a successful personality is self-acceptance. No real success, no genuine happiness is possible until a person gains some degree of self-acceptance. The most miserable and tortured people in the world are those who are continually straining and striving to convince themselves and others that they are something other than what they are. Success comes from self-expression when people relax and are not straining to be somebody else. Changing your self-image does not mean changing yourself or improving yourself, but changing your own mental picture, your own conception and estimation of that self. The amazing results which follow from developing a realistic self-image come about, not as a result of self-transformation,
but from self-realization. You can make the most of what's there by gaining a true mental picture of what is there. Most of us are better, wiser, stronger, and more competent than we realize. Creating a better self-image doesn't create new abilities, talents, or powers. It releases and utilizes them. Self-acceptance means coming to terms with ourselves now, just as we are, with all our faults, weaknesses, shortcomings, errors, as well as our assets and strengths. Self-acceptance is easier if we realize that these negatives belong to us, but they are not us. Many people shy away from healthy self-acceptance because they insist upon identifying themselves with their mistakes. You may have made a mistake, but this does not mean that you are a mistake. You have to recognize your mistakes and shortcomings before you can correct them. The first step toward becoming stronger is the recognition that one is weak. The prescription for increasing your self-acceptance is to begin by learning to tolerate imperfection in yourself. You must recognize your shortcomings, but don't hate yourself because of them. Learn to distinguish between yourself and your behavior. You are not ruined or worthless because you made a mistake or got off course, any more than a typewriter is worthless because it needs adjustment, or a violin when it's out of tune. Don't hate yourself because you're not perfect. Say to yourself, I may not be perfect. I may have faults and weaknesses. I might have gotten off the track. I may have a long way to go. But I am something, and I will make the most of that something. Accept yourself, be yourself, and resolve to realize the possibilities inherent in that special and unique something, which is you. Say to yourself, if I have a low opinion of myself, others will too. It is a vice I must overcome. I must stop carrying a mental picture of myself as defeated. I must stop selling myself short now. I must stop pitying myself now. I came into this world to succeed, and I will, by using the confidence of past successes in my present undertakings now. I must respect others as well as myself. I must appreciate my own worth. I'm somebody capable of error but capable of rising above it now. And finally, I must remember that negative feelings displace me from my true worth. I resolve now never to be a displaced person. Here is a second self-image builder. Look in the mirror and say to yourself, I'm a modern Sherlock Holmes, the greatest detective of all time. I'm tracking down the hurt feelings and the fears of yesterday. They have prevented me from becoming the better me, and I'm eliminating these fears and frustrations right now. I'm also the greatest archaeologist of the century. I'm digging deep within me to remove the debris of hurt feelings, resentments, hatred that has kept me from self-fulfillment. Underneath all this, I have found a great archaeological discovery. The real me. The better me. Dr. Maltz, who should be the most important friend in our lives? Yourself. You should be your own best friend before you should befriend others. After all, if you don't like yourself, who will? How do I know if my self-image is accurate? Only by making an accurate self-inventory and comparing it with your self-image. Dr. Maltz, if I don't like my self-image, can I change it? Yes, you can. You made your self-image in the first place, and you can change it, too. How do I change my self-image? First, you must have strong beliefs for deciding that your old self-image is an error. Then you must make your new self-image true and consistent with your real self. You must follow the steps outlined in these lessons for discarding the hindrances of the past the things that have caused your image of yourself to shrink. Dr. Maltz, what is the self? It is the central axis of your existence. It is what makes you unique. Can I change myself? Yes, but it is more important to change your self-image first. The rest will follow naturally because you act on the basis of your self-image, not yourself. 
What is the first prerequisite for self-discovery? Honesty. You cannot cheat yourself. You can only fool yourself. What is the difference between the self and the self-image? The self-image is the picture you have of yourself. Dr. Maltz, how long should it take me to get to know myself? Self-knowledge is a lifetime endeavor. You should make this a goal for the rest of your life. You are your own most important acquaintance. What should I do with myself when I discover things about it that I don't like? You become your own plastic surgeon, and you remove your blemishes with compassion, with the instrument of forgiveness. Forgive yourself for your mistakes, and forgive others for theirs. Maybe you have many of the characteristics of a successful personality, but you aren't happy or are not satisfied with your relationships with other people. Even if you haven't been scarred by a physical injury, possibly you are still nursing an emotional injury which is affecting your self-image and your personality. When you receive a physical injury, such as a cut on the face and it heals naturally, scar tissue will form which is both tougher and thicker than the original flesh because there is a certain amount of tension in the wound and just underneath the wound which pulls the surface of the skin back and creates a gap which is filled in by scar tissue. The purpose of the scar tissue is to form a protective cover or shell, nature's way of ensuring against another injury in the same place. When a plastic surgeon operates, he not only pulls the skin together by sutures, he also cuts out a small amount of flesh underneath the skin so that there is no tension present. The incision heals smoothly, evenly, and with no distorting surface scar. The same thing happens whenever we receive an emotional injury, when someone hurts us or rubs us the wrong way. We form emotional or spiritual scars for self-protection. We are very apt to become hardened of heart, callous toward the world, and to withdraw within a protective shell. This does not need to happen. If there is no tension present, there is no disfiguring emotional scar left. The choice is yours. You can feel hurt or feel offended, causing yourself emotional scars. Or you can choose not to respond and react by feeling relaxed and free from injury. We all need a certain amount of emotional toughness and ego security to protect us from real and imagined ego threats. The person with the hard, gruff exterior usually develops it because this person realizes that he or she is so soft inside that he or she needs protection. People with little or no self-reliance who feel emotionally dependent upon others make themselves most vulnerable to emotional hurts. As in the case of a physical scar, excessive protection against the original source of injury can make us more vulnerable and do us even more damage in other areas. The emotional wall that we build as protection against one person cuts us off from all other human beings and from our real selves. People who feel lonely or out of touch with other human beings also feel out of touch with their real self and with life. Emotional scars to our ego have an adverse effect. They lead to the development of a scarred, marred self-image. The picture of a person not liked or accepted by other human beings the picture of a person who can't get along well in the world of people in which he lives. Emotional scars prevent you from creative living. People with emotional scars not only have a self-image of being unwanted, unliked, and incapable people, but also have an image of the world in which they live as a hostile place. Their primary relationship with the world is one of hostility. Dealings with other people are not based upon giving and accepting, cooperating, working with, enjoying with, but upon concepts of overcoming, combating, and protecting from. People like this can neither be charitable toward others nor themselves. Frustration, aggression, and loneliness are the price they must pay. Once an emotional scar has formed, 
there is but one thing to do, and that is to remove it by surgery, the same as a physical scar. In removing old emotional scars, you alone can do the operation. You must become your own plastic surgeon and give yourself a spiritual facelift. The results will be new life and new vitality, a new found peace of mind and happiness. Old emotional scars cannot be doctored or medicated. They must be cut out, given up entirely, eradicated. Forgiveness, when it is real and genuine and complete and forgotten, is the scalpel which can remove the old emotional wounds, heal them, and eliminate scar tissue. Well, I give you four principles of spiritual and psychological relaxation. One, forgive others. No strings attached. No sense of condemnation. A clean, clean slate. No forgiveness on the installment plan. I love you today, Charlie, old boy, but tomorrow, can't stand the sight of you. Well, I forgive, Harry, but I can't forget. Now, what kind of forgiveness is that? With a mallet in your hand, ready to strike someone over the head if it suits you. It has to be a clean, clean slate. For whose sake? For your sake. The chances are the person you resent doesn't even know you're alive. <laughs> you forgive yourself so you can wake on eight cylinders instead of two. Two. You forgive yourself, you're only human. You must accept yourself with kind eyes when you look in the mirror. You are somebody. You are a child of God, capable of blunder, but capable of rising above it. And that a blunder is there for you to do something with it. It's a challenge. You are a mistake maker, but thank God you also a mistake breaker. You break that mistake, and that is your golden opportunity of recharging your energies, growing into the big you, taking advantage of an error to become the big you. Forgive others, forgive yourself, three. You see yourself at your best, as a person of confidence, not at your worst, as a person of frustration. You are these two people, you must make it your business to be the big you a greater share of the time. And finally, four, accept yourself for what you are. Don't try to be someone else when you're looking in the mirror and you see someone else's image there that you have to please. You're a dead pigeon. You're playing second fiddle to someone else and you can't function creatively. You're behind the eight ball. Get out into the open. Be yourself, accept yourself for what you are, and already you become a happier person. Pretended forgiveness, which is entered into as a duty, is no more effective than a simulated facial surgery. Your forgiveness should be forgotten, as well as the wrong which was forgiven. Forgiveness which is remembered and dwelt upon reinfects the wounds you are attempting to cauterize. Therapeutic forgiveness is not difficult. The only difficulty is to secure your own willingness to cancel out the debt with no mental reservations. We find it difficult to forgive only because we like our sense of condemnation. We get a perverse and morbid enjoyment out of nursing our wounds. As long as we can condemn another, we can feel superior. No one can deny that there is also a perverse sense of satisfaction in feeling sorry for yourself. True forgiveness comes only when we are able to see and emotionally accept that there is and was nothing for us to forgive. We should not have condemned or hated the other person in the first place. Not only do we incur emotional wounds from others, most of us inflict them upon ourselves. We beat ourselves over the head with self-condemnation, remorse, and regret. We beat ourselves down with self-doubt. We cut ourselves up with excessive guilt. Remorse and regret are attempts to emotionally live in the past. Excessive guilt is an attempt to make right something we did wrong or thought of as wrong in the past. Since we cannot live in the past, we cannot appropriately react emotionally to the past. The past can be simply written off, closed, forgotten, insofar as our emotional reactions are concerned. We do not need to take an emotional position one way or the other regarding detours that might have taken us off course in the past. 
The important thing is our present direction and our current goal. I remember I was speaking at one of the first churches of religious science out of California on my topic, how to be yourself. One stucky woman got up and told me what a wonderful thing my book, Psycho-Cybernetics, was to her. She read the book and finally, for the first time, learned how to be herself. I said, thank you very much. She said, don't interrupt. <laughs> I listened. <laughs> I listened. She said, doctor, I want you to know how I became myself through your book. I belong to a woman's organization, and the president of this organization talks too much. At all the meetings, she talks too much. I read your book, and I decided to be myself once and for all. And when we had a meeting, the president was talking too much as usual, and I stood up, and for the first time, I wobbed myself, and I said, shut up. <laughs> I didn't know how to answer it for a moment. <laughs> but being a student of self-image psychology, I quickly said, my dear lady, you are not yourself. <laughs> you use my book as an excuse. You must realize that when people use hatred and resentment like you have done, you can never be yourself. You give the worst part of yourself to others. You go back and read the book again. Get rid of your negative feelings. Get rid of the failure mechanism within you, the fear the resentment, the hatred, and all the things that create frustration and lack of belief in yourself. Get rid of that. And then you will learn to be yourself. Dr. Maltz advocates that when you give yourself a spiritual facelift by forgiving yourself and others, you'll feel younger, have more vitality, and will actually look younger. Carrying a grudge against someone or against life can bring on the old age stoop, just as much as carrying a heavy weight around on your shoulders would. People with emotional scars, grudges, and the like are living in the past, which is characteristic of some older people. The youthful attitude and youthful spirit, which erases wrinkles from the soul and the face and puts a sparkle in the eye, looks to the future and has a great expectation to look forward to. Why not give yourself a facelift? Your do-it-yourself kit consists of relaxation of negative tensions to prevent scars, therapeutic forgiveness to remove old scars, a willingness to be a little vulnerable, creative living, and a nostalgia for the future instead of the past. If you will try the techniques and attitudes recommended by Dr. Maltz, and model yourself after the characteristics of a successful personality for just 21 days, you will be amazed at the results. You can change your life for the better through the principles of psycho-cybernetics and steer your mind toward the productive, useful goal of being content and finding happiness and peace of mind in your everyday life and activities. You can get self-fulfillment by realizing that you're bigger than what you think you are. When you realize that you're somebody important, when you stop criticizing yourself, when you stop criticizing other people, when you realize that a negative feeling is there for you to hurdle, when you realize you cannot win all the goals, that if you only reach 60% of them, you are a champion in the art of living. You, when you realize that you cannot be perfect, no one is, that you are a mistake maker, but thank God you're a mistake breaker. 
When you realize that you should do one thing at a time, that you should live in the present, that when a situation defies solution, you sleep on it, not with it, so you can let your servo mechanism, your success mechanism within you, find the answer. When you accept yourself for who you are. Steam boilers have pressure gauges that show when the pressure is reaching the danger point. Signposts are placed on detours, dead end streets, and impassable roads. Likewise, the human body has its own signals and danger signs. They are the pressure gauges and signposts which are meant to help maintain the body in health. But we need to be able to recognize these failure symptoms in ourselves so that we can do something about them. When we learn to recognize certain personality traits as signposts to failure, these symptoms can then act automatically as negative feedback and guide us down the road to creative accomplishment. No one is immune to these negative feelings and attitudes. Even the most successful personalities experience them at times. The important thing is to recognize them for what they are and take positive action to correct course. The failure personality has seven basic characteristics, all interconnected. Each of the negatives is usually adopted as a way to solve a difficulty or a problem. Each has meaning and purpose, but is based on a mistaken premise. We can cure these failure symptoms by understanding them, seeing that they do not work. The first area is frustration. Whenever some important goal cannot be realized or some strong desire is thwarted, Frustration develops. We can learn to tolerate a certain amount of frustration without becoming upset about it. It's when a frustrating experience brings excessive emotional feelings of deep dissatisfaction and futility that becomes a symptom of failure. Chronic frustration usually means that the goals we have set for ourselves are unrealistic, or the image we have of ourselves is inadequate, or both. So we must face our goals and our self-image as truthfully as we know how and bring them close to reality. Realistic goals and an accurate self-image can go a long way toward eliminating frustration. How do you overcome frustration? Well, you must overcome frustration by knowing some of your assets. Your liabilities is your fear that you must remember. The misfortunes hardest to bear are those that never come. You must also remember what Aristotle said. Nothing in the affairs of man is worthy too much anxiety. To you overcome your fear, you must refuse to retreat from your own identity because of frustration. You must refuse to surrender your dignity and self-respect and your self-image because of frustration. You must stop seeking excuses because you made a mistake. You must stop living in yesterday. You mustn't carry 40 or 50 pounds of extra mental weight on your back every day of your life because of some mistake you made 14 years ago or 14 days ago. You live in the present. You rise above it. You must get rid of negative feelings. You must get rid of the depression surrounding negative feelings. Just remember, please, that negative feelings are there for you as an incentive to rise above it, to make something of yourself. That's what makes you the big you. That's what makes you the professional human being. The second negative is aggressiveness. Emotional steam is necessary to reach a goal. But the trouble begins when we are blocked or frustrated from achieving that goal. 
The emotional steam is then bottled up, seeking an outlet. Misdirected or unused, it becomes a destructive force. The failure-type personality, their aggressiveness blocked in the accomplishment of a worthwhile goal, channels itself into self-destructive paths, like ulcers, high blood pressure, excessive smoking, compulsive overwork, or it may be turned on others in the form of irritability, rudeness, gossip, fault-finding. The answer to aggression is to understand it and provide appropriate channels for its expression. All types of physical exercise are excellent for draining off excess aggression, and the best way of all is to use it up as it was intended to be used, in working towards some goal. Work remains one of the best therapies and one of the best tranquilizers for a troubled spirit. The third characteristic of the failure mechanism is insecurity. A feeling of insecurity is based on an inner belief of inadequacy. If we feel that we don't measure up to what is required, we feel insecure. The problem is that we compare our actual abilities to an imagined ideal perfect self. Ideals should be thought of not as firm goals to be achieved, but abstracts to reach toward and always to reach forward. Like a bicycle. As a rider, you maintain your balance, poise, and sense of security only as you move forward. When you stop, give up, you lose the security and equilibrium you had when you were moving towards something. How do you cope with the feeling you shouldn't succeed because your success means someone else's failure? I think it's obligatory upon you as a human being to be successful in anything you do. Do not worry about other people, provided you don't step on other people and push people aside. Provided you don't step on your own toes with negative feelings as you are right now. You're afraid that you won't succeed and you don't want to make an effort to do so. The fourth negative characteristic is loneliness. Being occasionally lonely is very different from the extreme and chronic feeling of loneliness, of being cut off, alienated from other people. This type of loneliness is caused by an alienation from life, an estrangement from the needs of the real self. Because of it, human contact are not very satisfying, and a person becomes a social recluse. Loneliness thus becomes a method of self-protection. When lines of communication and emotional ties with other people are cut, we protect our idealized selves against exposure, hurt, and humiliation. This withdrawal cuts off one of the pathways to finding oneself. Doing things with other people helps us to drop false loneliness. As we get to know others, we feel less need for pretense. We thaw, we become more natural. We feel more comfortable just being ourselves. If you are lonely, force yourself to mix and mingle with other people. It is a psychological principle that constant exposure to the object of fear immunizes against the fear. As you force yourself into social relations with other human beings, you will find that most people are friendly and will accept you. Their acceptance will enable you to accept yourself. The fifth negative of the failure mechanism is uncertainty. According to Dr. Maltz in Psycho-Cybernetics, one of the greatest mistakes you can make is to be afraid of making one. Uncertainty is a way of avoiding mistakes and responsibility. It is based on the false assumption that if no decision is made, nothing can go wrong. We must realize that a person doesn't have to be right 100% of the time. Babe Ruth, who created a long-standing record for the most home runs, also held the record for the most strikeouts. It is in the nature of things that we progress by acting, making mistakes, and correcting course. A guided missile arrives at its target literally by making a series of mistakes and continually correcting its heading. You cannot correct your heading if you are standing still. We must consider the known facts in a situation, imagine possible consequences of various courses of action, choose one that seems to offer the best solution, and bet on it. You can correct your course as you go. 
Many people are indecisive because they fear a loss of self-esteem if they are proved wrong. Successful personalities make mistakes and admit them. It is the failure personality who is afraid to admit to being wrong. Actually, we learn more from our mistakes than from our successes. We often discover what will work by finding out what will not work. When Thomas Edison was asked if he was discouraged because of so many failures, he said, No, I am not discouraged, because every wrong attempt discarded is another step forward. The sixth negative to avoid in the failure mechanism is resentment. When a failure-type personality looks for a reason for their failure, they often blame society, the system, life, the bricks. They resent the success and happiness of others because it is proof to them that life is shortchanging them, that they are being treated unfairly. Resentment is an attempt to make our own failure palatable by explaining it in terms of unfair treatment, injustice. As a salve for failure, resentment is a cure that is worse than the disease. It is a deadly poison to the spirit, makes happiness impossible, and uses up tremendous energy which can go into accomplishment. Resentment is also a way of making us feel important. Many people get a perverse satisfaction from feeling wronged. The victim of injustice, the one who has been unfairly treated, feels morally superior to those who supposedly caused the injustice. Resentment is also an emotional rehashing or refighting of some event in the past. You cannot win because you are attempting to do the impossible, change the past. Resentment even when based upon real injustices and wrongs, soon becomes an emotional habit. Habitual resentment invariably leads to self-pity, which is the worst possible emotional habit anyone can develop, according to Dr. Malt. When these habits take over, a person doesn't feel right or natural when they are absent. One begins to look for, search for injustices. One feels good only when one is miserable. Remember, your resentment is not caused by other persons, events, or circumstances. It is caused by your own emotional response, your own reaction. You alone have power over this, and you can control it if you firmly convince yourself that resentment and self-pity are not ways to happiness and success, but ways to defeat and unhappiness. As long as you harbor resentment, it is literally impossible for you to picture yourself as a self-reliant, independent, self-determining person. Resentful people turn over their reins to other people. They are wholly dependent upon them, make unreasonable demands and claims upon them. They feel everyone should be dedicated to making them happy, and are resentful when it doesn't work out that way. Resentment is inconsistent with creative goal striving. In creative goal striving, you are the actor, not the passive recipient. No one owes you anything. You set your own goals. You become responsible for your own success and happiness. Resentment doesn't fit into this picture. And because it doesn't, it is a failure mechanism. You have self-respect when you don't hate yourself. You have self-respect if you don't hate yourself because you won't hate another human being. You have self-respect when you have compassion for yourself and with other people. You have self-respect when you stop hurting other people by unkind cuts and criticism. You have self-respect when you stop criticizing yourself that you're nobody when you're somebody. You have self-respect when you get rid of uncertainty, when you get rid of resentment, and when you understand your needs and the needs of other people, you have self-respect when you create opportunities for yourself. Opportunity doesn't knock. Opportunity, you hear it inside. If it knocks, it knocks inside because you are opportunity, you create it. You develop it. When you create these opportunities, you enlarge the scope of your self-respect. You enlarge the scope of your self-respect and improve your self-image when your goal is realistic within your capabilities. When you have confidence that you can reach it, 
When you accept yourself for what you are, when you look in the mirror, you gotta see you in lose at all. The seventh characteristic of a failure personality is emptiness. Many people seem to be successful in spite of frustration, misdirected aggressiveness and resentment, but all too often their lives are empty because they lose the capacity to enjoy. When you have lost the capacity to enjoy, no amount of wealth or anything else can bring success or happiness. No goal is worth working for. Life is a terrible bore. Nothing is worthwhile. Emptiness is a symptom that you are not living creatively. You either have no goal that is important enough to you, or you are not using your talents and efforts in striving toward an important goal. The person who has no purpose or goal concludes that life itself is not worthwhile. But the individual who is actively engaged in striving toward an important goal has no time for pessimistic philosophies concerning the meaninglessness, the futility of life. Emptiness can become a way of avoiding effort, work, and responsibility. It becomes an excuse, a justification for non-creative living. Emptiness may also be the symptom of an inadequate self-image. The person who holds an unworthy, undeserving self-image may achieve a genuine success and then be unable to accept it psychologically and therefore unable to enjoy it. Real success never hurt anyone. Striving for goals which are important to you, not as status symbols, but because they are consistent with your own deep inner wants, is helpful. Striving for real success through creative accomplishment brings a deep inner satisfaction. Striving for false success to please others brings false and fleeting satisfaction. Now that we have gone over the seven characteristics of a negative personality, you should watch for them and deal with them, but don't brood over them. Your automobile is equipped with negative indicators on the dash panel which tell you when the battery is not charging, when the engine is becoming too hot, when the oil pressure is becoming too low. To ignore these negatives might ruin the car, but you don't need to become too upset when a negative signal flashes. It doesn't mean the car is no good. You should merely take prompt, positive action. As the driver of the car, you, of course, don't look at the control panel exclusively and continuously. Most of the time, you look out through the windshield, keeping your primary attention on your goal, where you are going. You merely glance quickly at the negative indicators from time to time. Adopt a similar attitude towards your own negative symptoms. Don't dwell on them, but be aware of negatives so that you can correct them. Negative thinking can work for us to lead us to success, according to Dr. Maltz in Psycho-Cybernetics, if, one, we are sensitive to the negative to the extent that it can alert us to danger. Two, we recognize the negative for what it is, something undesirable, something we don't want, something that does not bring genuine happiness. Three, we take immediate corrective action and substitute an opposite factor from the success mechanism. Such practice will in time create an automatic reflex, which becomes a part of our inner guidance system. Negative feedback will act as a sort of automatic control to help us steer clear of failure and guide us to success. Tell yourself that it's only natural for people to be frustrated about something during the day, but it is destructive to carry some frustrations from the past on your back. Imagine the absurdity of carrying a 50-pound burden of past frustrations on your back and not being able to lay it down. Remember that when you're frustrated, you're actually cheating yourself. Resolve to forget past vexations now. Substitute a positive in the present for a negative in the past. This is how you change from unhappiness to happiness. Say to yourself, I've wasted too many hours worrying about the mistakes of the past, the hurt feelings, the hours wasted that I could have used helping others to improve myself. I quit right now. I know that I can't be a friend to others until I'm a friend to myself. You can remove your emotional scars by plastic surgery of compassion. Here are some miracle drugs 
for emotional scars. You might try them. Forgive others. They're just as fallible as you are. They're not gods and are not machines. They're just human beings like yourself. Forgive yourself. Forget your own mistakes. Stop torturing yourself with self-blame. Keep up with yourself, not with others. See yourself at your best. Picture yourself in a situation you've relished, when things seem to fit into place, and your world was as you like it. Recapture the good feelings of those moments. Keep these rather than your failure feelings alive in your mind. In this way, you can heal your emotional scars and immunize yourself against further emotional injury. Once you begin to like yourself better, you undo the damage of the past. You will be ready to move toward the achievements of success that are realistic for you and toward the cultivation of constructive habits that lead to happiness. Here are your 10 principles of overcoming unhappiness. One, unhappiness means loneliness. No one can make you lonely without your consent. Two, unhappiness means loss of your true identity. No one can make you lose your identity without your consent. Three, unhappiness means limitation, separation from self, from others. You put yourself in your own jail. Remember, no one could put you there without your consent. Four, psychologically, you must let the telephone ring. Create a tranquilizer between you and negative feelings. In subtropical countries, people use an umbrella to avoid sunstroke. Use a mental umbrella to avoid a tension stroke. Five, in place of an old habit of over-responding to tension, Substitute a new habit of delaying response. Six, keep your eye on the ball, your daily productive goal. Seven, stop fighting negative forces in your mind. Eight, think of a geyser letting off steam, a symbol for you to release your tension. Nine, relaxation is your built-in tranquilizer. Use it continually in all your pursuits. Ten, your self-image is your emotional and spiritual thermostat. Keep it well regulated. Let it pulse with enthusiasm, not with despair. To sum up, unhappiness is curable when you realize that no one can make you unhappy without your consent. You and you alone can turn a negative habit into a positive one. Remember that happiness is communicable health. You can catch it if you wish to. What causes emotional scars? Real or imagined injury, hurt feelings, remorse, guilt, heartache, or resentment. In short, all the negative feelings that human beings are heir to. What is the result of these scars? Protection against all other people. What does this protection do to me? It walls you off from other humans and your own real self. Why do many juveniles, as well as some adults, act as if they hate everyone in authority? They were once hurt by someone they trusted. They then fear further exposure to possible injury. So they react with suspicion and hostility and drive away those who would love them if given a chance. What do emotional scars do to my self-image? You see yourself as unliked and unaccepted by a hostile world. Thus, you actually disfigure your own self-image. How do emotional scars affect my more creative living? They block self-fulfillment. They steer you away from your goals. You must realize that it is you and you alone who are in a position to remove your emotional scars. You must nourish your self-respect and develop confidence in your own sense of direction. What is a self-fulfilled person? A person who sees himself as liked, wanted, acceptable, and able. A person who feels oneness with others. He possesses a rich store of information and knowledge. Are you born self-fulfilled? No. Self-fulfillment has to be achieved. 
What are three rules for immunizing yourself against emotional hurts? Be too big to feel threatened. Have a self-reliant, responsible attitude. Relax away emotional hurts. How can one be too big to feel threatened? Develop self-esteem. You must retain respect for yourself even though you fail in an undertaking. You must always rise above a failure and try to reach your full stature of dignity as a real, fulfilled person. How do I learn to relax away my emotional hurts? Program yourself for pleasant thinking. Concentrate on building self-confidence, esteem, self-expansion. Re-evaluate your beliefs. Live creatively. Why do I feel hurt? By choice. You do not have to respond at all times with negative feelings. Your negative feelings are there for you to rise above. You must learn to stand up under stress by remaining relaxed and free. You must see that you should not make mountains out of molehills. Be too big to be threatened by one error. The happiness principle. The happiness principle in simple terms means this. The more you share your happiness with others, the more you have yourself. It also means the happier you are, the wiser you are. And finally, happiness is good as unhappiness is evil. When you're happy, the glorious things in nature are more visible. The flowers smell better. The sound of a rippling brook is more distinct. Food tastes better. The hand of friendship is firmer and your voice has more life to it. On the other hand, when you're unhappy, you cannot see the beauty without and within. You don't hear as well as you could. Nothing smells right. The food doesn't taste right. Your touch is benumbed and your voice is lost in loneliness. Happiness is internal. It means clear perception within you where you see the possibilities of becoming bigger and better than what you are for yourself and for others, sharing your good fortune with others who need your goodwill desperately. In unhappiness, your spiritual vision is clouded by a mental cataract. When you cannot see the good in you, when you cannot be kind to yourself or wise enough to realize that loneliness and fear are your blind spots, Remember the words of John Masefield, the famous poet laureate of England. The days that make us happy make us wise. Dr. Maltz says that personality is not so much something that is acquired from without as something that is released from within. This real self within every person is attractive, is magnetic. It does have a powerful impact and influence upon other people. We have the feeling that we are in touch with something real and basic, and it does something to us. On the other hand, a phony is universally disliked and detested. When we say that a person has a good personality, what we really mean is that this person has freed and released the creative potential within oneself, and is able to express his or her real self. Poor personality and inhibited personality are one and the same. The person with a poor personality does not express the creative self within. He has restrained it, handcuffed it, locked it up, and thrown away the key. The inhibited personality has imposed restraint upon the expression of the real self. People like this are afraid to express themselves, afraid to be their self, and have locked up their real self within an inner prison. The symptoms of inhibition are many and varied. Shyness, timidity, self-consciousness, hostility, feelings of excessive guilt, insomnia, nervousness, irritability, inability to get along with others. Frustration is characteristic of practically every area and activity of the inhibited personality. Their real and basic frustration is their failure to be themselves and to adequately express themselves. But this basic frustration is likely to color and overflow into all that they do. The science of cybernetics gives us a new insight into
related to the inhibited personality and shows us the way toward disinhibition, freedom, and how to release our spirits from self-imposed prisons. Please fast forward to the end and turn the tape over for proper cueing of side four. Negative feedback in a servo mechanism is equivalent to criticism. Negative feedback says you are wrong, you are off course, you need to take corrective action to get back on the beam. The purpose of negative feedback, however, is to modify response and change the course of forward action, not to stop it altogether. Negative feedback says what you are doing is wrong, but it does not say it is wrong to do anything. When negative feedback is excessive or where our own mechanism is too sensitive to negative feedback, the result is not modification of response, but total inhibition of response. Inhibition and excessive negative feedback are one and the same. When we overreact to negative feedback, we are likely to conclude that not only is our present course slightly off beam or wrong, but that it is wrong for us even to want to go forward. Have you ever noticed that when you try very carefully to do something like thread a needle or pour liquid into a very small neck bottle, that very often your hand is steady until you try to accomplish your purpose? Then for some strange reason you quiver and shake. This is called purpose tremor, when you're trying too hard to accomplish a task. Excessive carefulness or being too anxious not to make an error is a form of excessive negative feedback. The result is inhibition and deterioration of performance. Excessive carefulness and anxiety are close kin. Both have to do with too much concern for possible failure or doing the wrong thing and making too much of a conscious effort to do right. Just like when your bicycle chain is too tight, your carefulness and conscientiousness may be so tense that it hinders the running of your mind. When you become too consciously concerned about what others think, when you become too careful to consciously try to please other people, when you become too sensitive to the real or fancied disapproval of other people, then you have excessive negative feedback, inhibition, and poor performance. Whenever you constantly and consciously monitor your every act, word, or manner, again you become inhibited and self-conscious. You become too careful to make a good impression and in so doing choke off, restrain, inhibit your creative self and end up making a rather poor impression. The way to make a good impression on other people is never consciously try to make a good impression on them. Never act or fail to act purely for consciously contrived effect. Never wonder consciously what the other person is thinking of you, how he is judging you. Poise is the attitude of being immune to strangers or strange situations, a total disregard for all the unknown or unexpected. It is the deliberate setting aside of all fears arising from new and uncontrollable circumstances. If you are among the millions who suffer unhappiness and failure because of inhibition, you need to deliberately practice disinhibition. You need to practice being less careful, less concerned, less conscientious. You need to practice speaking before you think instead of thinking before you speak. Acting without thinking instead of thinking or carefully considering before you act. Balance and harmony are what is needed. When the temperature has gone too high, the doctor attempts to lower it. When it has sunk too low, he attempts to raise it. When a person cannot sleep enough, a prescription is given to make the patient sleep more. It is not a question of which is best. The cure lies in taking a long step in the opposite direction. Once again, the principle of cybernetics enters into the picture. 
Our goal is an adequate, self-fulfilling, creative personality. The path to the goal is a course between too much inhibition and too little. When there is too much, we correct course by ignoring inhibition and practicing more disinhibition. Here are the feedback signals which tell you whether you are off course because of too much or too little inhibition. If you continually get yourself into trouble because of overconfidence, if you habitually rush in where angels fear to tread, if you habitually find yourself in hot water because of impulsive, ill-considered actions, if projects backfire on you because you always practice acting first and asking questions later, if you can never admit you're wrong, if you are a loud talker and a blabbermouth, you probably have too little inhibition. You need to think more of consequences before acting. You need to stop acting like a bull in a china shop and plan your activities more carefully. However, the great majority of people do not fall in that category. If you are shy around strangers, if you dread new and strange situations, if you feel inadequate, worry a lot, are anxious, overly concerned, if you are nervous and feel self-conscious, if you have any nervous symptoms such as facial tics, blinking your eyes unnecessarily, tremor, difficulty in going to sleep, if you feel ill at ease in social situations, if you hold yourself back and continually take a back seat, then these are all symptoms showing that you have too much inhibition. You are too careful in everything. You plan too much. You should practice these exercises. One. Don't wonder in advance what you are going to say. Just open your mouth and say it. Improvise as you go along. Two, don't plan or think before you act. Act and correct your actions as you go along. Three, stop criticizing yourself. The inhibited person indulges in self-critical analysis continually. Don't say to yourself, I wonder if I should have done that or maybe i shouldn't have said that or maybe the other person will take it the wrong way conscious self-criticism or self-analysis on a moment by moment or day by day basis is defeating four make a habit of speaking louder than usual inhibited people are notoriously soft-spoken raise the volume of your voice you don't have to shout at people and use an angry tone just consciously practice speaking louder than usual Loud talk in itself is a powerful disinhibitor. 5. Let people know when you like them. The inhibited personality is as afraid of expressing good feelings as bad ones. Don't be afraid to express love. Compliment others without worrying about them thinking it is superficial or having an ulterior motive. Totally ignore all these negative feedback signals. If you like what someone is doing, wearing, or saying, let him or her know it. If we are habitually frustrated by failure, we are very apt to acquire habitual feelings of failure, which color all new undertakings. But by arranging things so that we can succeed in little things, we can build an atmosphere of success which will carry over into larger undertakings. We can gradually undertake more difficult tasks, and after succeeding in them, be in a position to undertake something even more challenging. Success is literally built upon success, and there is much truth in the saying, nothing succeeds like success. The principle is merely to start with an opponent over which you can succeed, and gradually take on more and more difficult tasks. Everyone has at some time or another been successful in the past. It does not have to have been a big success. What you succeed in is not so important as the feeling of success which attended it. All that is needed is some experience where you succeeded in doing what you wanted, in achieving what you set out to achieve, and something that brought you some feeling of satisfaction. Go back in memory and relive those successful experiences. In your imagination, revive the entire picture in as much detail as you can. The more detailed you can make it, the better. If you can remember in sufficient detail just what happened when you were successful at some time in the past, you will find yourself feeling just as you felt then. 
you will find yourself feeling self-confident because self-confidence is built upon memories of past successes. Dr. Maltz recommends that we forget and ignore those unhappy experiences from the past and concentrate upon the happy and pleasant. By so doing, we strengthen the thought patterns having to do with success and happiness and weaken those having to do with failure and unhappiness. Remember, you are a responsible person, able to cope with your past and plan your future, as opposed to being a helpless victim of your past experiences. This concept does carry a responsibility, however. No longer can you derive sickly comfort from blaming your parents, society, your early experiences, or the injustices of others for your present troubles. These things may and should help you understand how you got where you are. Blaming them, or even yourself for the past mistakes, however, will not solve your problem or improve your present or your future. There is no merit in blaming yourself. The past explains how you got here. But where you go from here is your responsibility. The choice is yours. Like a broken phonograph, you can keep on playing the same old broken record of the past, reliving past injustices, pitying yourself for past mistakes, all of which reactivate failure patterns and failure feelings which color your present and your future. Or, if you choose, you can put on a new record and reactivate success patterns and that winning feeling which helps you do better in the present and promises a more enjoyable future. When your phonograph is playing music you don't like, you do not try to force it to do better. You do not use effort or willpower. You do not bang the phonograph around. You do not try to change the music itself. You merely change the record being played, and the music takes care of itself. Use the same technique on the music that comes out of your own internal machine. Don't pitch your will directly against the music. As long as the same mental imagery occupies your attention, no amount of effort will change the music. Instead, try putting a new record on. Change the mental imagery, and the feelings will take care of themselves. I'd like you to come with me on a voyage. It's a voyage of discovery. I'd like you to come with me on a voyage on the vast inner spaces of your mind to find the very, very important treasure. This treasure is yourself. I'd like you to come with me in a room of your mind, in a playhouse of your mind, in a theater of your mind, with a stage upon which I stand. I'd like you to see yourself on this stage as a detective, a modern Sherlock Holmes with a magnifying glass searching the hurt feelings within you to discover them, to release yourself from these feelings. I'd like you to be more than a modern detective discovering the evil within you, but to discover something far more important, the good within you. I'd like you to be an archaeologist, digging for the treasure of your self-respect and dignity as a human being in God's image, to dig under the debris of failure, of mistakes, of hurt feelings, of resentment to find that side of you 
that truly belongs to you, that is you. That side of you is in God's image. I'd like you to see yourself on this stage as a person with tattoo marks on your arm, a displaced person within yourself, displaced because of hurt feelings, because of negative feelings, because of frustration, and it is in your power to displace yourself back to where you belong. I ask you to come with me on a new voyage of discovery where you are your own Galileo, seeing the sun within you as your personality rotates about it. I should like you to imagine that you have, like Balboa, discovered the Pacific that vast area of peace within your mind that can be yours. I ask you to be a friend to yourself, for only in that realization can you be a friend to someone else. I ask you to think of yourself and believe in yourself as a successful human being. For only then can you be a success outside of yourself. I ask you to be yourself, to understand your rights, to evoke the better part of you, to see yourself at your best. You can do that by walking into this room of your mind into this playhouse, this theater of your mind, where you will do one thing, relax. People with tension, with hurt feelings, with fear, cannot relax. They can only be self-confident and succeed in their undertaking, no matter how small it may be, if they are relaxed. So that the first important thing to do, if you are to get to know the better part of yourself, is learn to relax in the theater of your mind, where you do a few simple things. First thing you do is to give others. Don't carry grudges. More important, forgive yourself. See yourself at your best. In this room of your mind, you imagine. You see through a window a geyser letting off Steam. This is a symbol for you to let go of the tension for a moment, to let go of the electric circuit of distress and depression, so that you can renew and replenish your energies for the worries that may come tomorrow. The business of living is not to be successful. The business of living is to rise above a failure, to rise above a mistake. This is what gives you the strength to your intellectual fibers. This is what gives you a sense of self-confidence that you can be and are in God's image and can accomplish goals within your capability. 
on this stage of your mind. You are in the audience. You are on the stage. You are the writer. You are the performer. And you can change the script. You can see yourself on one occasion as the worried, fretful person, the person of frustration. At another occasion, you can see yourself as the competent person, with a smile on your face, with a smile on your self-image. Now, these two people are you. They're two aspects of you. You will learn to concentrate on the confident part of yourself to which you are heir and to declare war on the negative feelings that create the person of distress. I stand here and talk to you from the stage. Am I alone? Or is there someone with me? Is it just my face that you see? Or is it as I speak to you to give you part of what I have? Is it that you see the face behind my face, the face of my mind? I call this face of my mind the stranger within. We all have a stranger within us only because we are not aware of him. This stranger can be your friend. This stranger can be your enemy. You are the one who makes the choice. You are the one who controls this stranger within. He does not control you. You are the one that has the capacity, if you understood this stranger within, to decide, to discard the worried, fretful, discordant, and disconsolate person that you can be, and the person of confidence gained from our past experiences when we were happy, these experiences that we use in the undertaking of our present goal. This stranger needn't be a stranger. He can be your best friend if you learn to realize that you can dispose of your negative feelings, forget the past, forget the mistakes of yesterday, because the business of living is to live now, this day, today. Today is 24 hours of a lifetime. You can and must make the best of it. And when you do, when you discard the hurt feelings, the negative feelings of the past, the frustrations, the hatred, those negative feelings that take you away from yourself, from people, that produce loneliness. It is within your capabilities to discard this aspect of you by knowing that you have a success mechanism within you working for you, helping you achieve the dignity that is within you. You must learn not to keep up with the Joneses. You must learn to keep up with yourself. You must learn to know this stranger within, this heartbeat of your mind, this thermostat of your emotions, because you control this stranger. You can make him your best friend. We, as we 
practice the art of living with our fears and our joys every day, do not realize that we have a servo mechanism within our brain, a tape recorder of all our past experiences, the happy ones, the unhappy ones. And if we, in our present undertaking, recall the past failures, the past resentments, we automatically cannot succeed because you cannot think positively with negative feelings any more than you can think negatively when you have positive feelings. We have this success mechanism within us, and it is there for us to develop. It is a sense of direction, a goal every day, the understanding of the needs of others, the courage to stand up under tension, the respect for yourself before you can achieve the respect of others, self-acceptance accepting yourself for what you are, not trying to keep up with the Joneses. Animals have a certain success mechanism. Birds, when it's cold, fly south to warm weather to protect themselves, to survive. A squirrel, who was born in the spring, you'll find this squirrel seeking nuts and hiding them for the winter, though this squirrel has never seen a winter. We too have a success mechanism to live successfully in God's image. If we can understand that the difference between the animal and the human is this part of the brain, the forebrain, our desires, our hopes, our goals, our achievements. If you know this self-image of yours, you can teach yourself to rise to your full stature of self-respect as a human being by remembering that you came to this world to succeed, to be a success, and not a failure. You do this, and you achieve the knowledge of yourself and understand your self-image through the power of your imagination. Imagination is not given just to the poets. You are a poet within yourself. You have imagination, and you use it every day. I've asked you to come with me in a room of your mind. I ask you to be an archaeologist and dig beneath the debris of hurt feelings to find yourself, the good in you, the self-respect that belongs to you. I ask you to come with me on this voyage of discovery of yourself, where you'll be your own detective. And through the magnifying glass, look at yourself and find that you are better than what you think you are. I ask you to be your own plastic surgeon by uprooting the evil within you. I will give you a medical kit of 12 things that will make you be your own plastic surgeon and lift your spirit to its full stature. To thine own self be true, Shakespeare said. Remember that. Use your imagination constructively. Relax for a few minutes every day. See yourself at your best. Have that winning feeling that all human beings are capable of. Unmask yourself. Don't have to live in pretense. Have compassion. Not only for others, but for yourself. Understand your rights as a human being. 
never retire from yourself or from life. It's antagonistic to the process of living. Find your true worth. Accept yourself for what you are. Don't try to keep up with the Joneses. How much more fascinating it is to join with me on this great adventure of finding yourself, of improving your God's image that's within you. Thank you. This has been an Audio Renaissance presentation.